We have some people who are joining our church family this morning. Here's what they shared with us about their desire to make Countryside their church home. I'm Lydia Marcy. I've been going to Countryside most of my life. I've really grown to love the teaching and how it's solid in the Bible and in the truth. And I love the worship and the family in Christ I have here. And I'm just excited to officially be a member of the church. My name is Courtney Slavin. I've been attending Countryside my whole life. I'm excited for new opportunities to serve and for the opportunity for this church to hold me accountable. I'm also looking forward to holding others accountable to be more Christ-like. And I'm very excited to make this my church home. At this time, would you all please stand? Let's open our worship service with these words from Psalm 90 verses one through two. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls reward till the faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw a day when the longed for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the The church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner. Well, we are excited this morning to introduce a slightly updated version of a Countryside classic, uh, Complete in Me. If you've been around Countryside for close to 20 years, you know this is kind of one of the first songs we introduced in the mid-2000s that was very guitar-based. Um, up until that point, it was very much piano-driven here. 
And uh, throughout the years, we've enjoyed it. The, the uh, words are amazing. It's such a rich song, but we've never really been able to throw a new spin on it. So that ends today. Uh, making history now. So the chorus is still the same. We just have a new verse melody and some new chords in there. So we're going to do what we always do with new songs and just do the first verse and the first chorus as a band. And then uh, we'll swing back around and you guys can join us to start it over.
really appreciate the music team and that new uh, addition to the song that helps us. I know for me, it helps me think more about the words as it feels fresh and new, such great truth for us to sing. Uh, you all can be seated. As we come to this portion of the service, we're remembering <clears throat> that we have a great opportunity to worship through giving. And you can do that uh, today. There's boxes here. You can give online. God's been doing a lot at Countryside. I'm so encouraged that our God is not finished with us yet. So he continues to supply our needs. He's opening doors for ministry. He's continuing to work in our hearts. So have you thanked him yet today? Have you thanked him? Let's take a moment to do that. When we ask uh, for God's help, let's also praise him and thank him for what he's been doing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for not being done with us. Thank you for the, the countless ways that you're blessing our church family right now. You've given us this place to gather in. You've given us teachers and counselors and pastors and deacons and small groups and ministries that are increasing and learning more of you, growing in the grace of and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've done more for our church family than we could have dreamed of. Your provision is extraordinary. It's extravagant. So, thank you. You're so kind to us. Lord, we want to continue in this service with right hearts and joyful praise, generous fellowship, but we need you for that. We need you for that because there's sin here. You know the thoughts and intentions of every heart in this room. God, we ask that you would reign in our hearts today. Please produce fruit through us. And we need your grace as we fellowship together. Because some of us are going to have hurt feelings today. Some of us are going to be overlooked and lonely. Some of us will be tempted to leave, frustrated, full of thoughts that swirl around selfish loves. Lord, would you replace that here? Replace our pride with humility. Replace our anger with love. Replace our self-pity with servants' hearts. Replace our greed with generosity. But Lord, we ask that you would do something even more amazing than that. Would you open the spiritual eyes of those who are here but lost in their sin and destined for your wrath? We can't change their hearts, no amount of preaching or classes or ministry functions can do the change that only you can accomplish. We can't make them repent or have faith. We know you can't. We ask that you, would do, that you would do that amazing, eternal wonder, even in our midst here today, among those who don't know you. At this time, we also remember that you're working in Sinaloa, Mexico, through the, the ministry of Pastor Brian Warren. You're working in Maceo and Aracaju, Brazil, through the ministries of Pastor Roger and our faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who are there. And we also remember that you're at work in Lawrence through Redemption Hill Church with Pastor J.D. and Pastor Stephen. In each of these places, Lord, we ask that you would do the things that we've requested for our church today, that you would guide hearts, that you would work, that sin would be dumped, that some may gain spiritual life. We trust you. We've experienced your grace, and so we're thankful. So God, please have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, as we prepare to take part in the beautiful ordinance of the Lord's Supper, it's time to make sure you've got the elements uh, so they're on the back table. You can go for it. In order to participate, you need to be born again. 
So you need to have repented of your sins and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. If you haven't done that, or if you're under any church's discipline, we just ask that you would abstain today. Let's take a few moments in the quiet to just pause and scan the horizon of our own hearts. If you know or find unconfessed sin, sin that you've not dealt with, please deal with that between you and the Lord. That's what this uh, time is for right now. Let's do that together. Amen. Would you, uh, with me, we can all open these elements together real quick. Let's do that. Open up and take out the cracker and open up the juice. Just try not to spill it for the next two minutes here. (coughs) The Lord's Supper is our weekly celebration of what Jesus accomplished. So the elements that we're holding in our hands, they're little pictures that remind us of the cost of our salvation. We don't don't get access to God uh, without Jesus' body being broken on our account. We don't get to receive forgiveness for our sins without Jesus' blood being spilled to atone for us. So... Everything else in life should be put on pause right now as we remember this. As we remember Jesus, I want you to think about one word for a moment. One word. The word justified. Justified. We just sang about it in the song Complete in Me. And Paul writes the following in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, that God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Have you ever stopped to think about that day when you stand before God? We're all going to do it. We're all going to do it. We'll all reach that final day, and it's really kind of an intimidating scene, if you think about it. We'll stand there, we'll stand, and, and in front of us will be the, the glory of God, the God of all righteousness and infinite purity and holiness in all His perfection. And in that moment, we'll stand with every thought and word and action of our lives piled up behind us. It'll be too much to hide. Maybe we'll try to get ourselves in position to kind of cover up some of it. But we won't be able to. Nothing will be covered up. Everything will be seen. We will be utterly bare before Him. In fact, the sin and the filth of our lives will embarrassingly topple over and spill all around our feet. He'll see it all. He'll see everything. And in that moment when we wait to hear the sentence of the Almighty Judge, whatever He says next will pronounce our eternity. And as we stand there, Jesus, He'll know of what we're, uh, what, what the sin we've accomplished in our lifetimes is. He'll know of our rejection of God, and He'll see it all. And as we wait for His next word, Jesus will say, justified, 
justified. See, that's what Jesus accomplished. I don't really think that the reality of salvation is ever going to shake us the way it will in that moment. Because we will understand in the fullest sense the depth of his love and his grace. We'll understand it like never before. How could we possibly walk out of that scene into eternal paradise? The only way is through the sacrifice of Jesus. God showed his love for filthy sinners. Christ died for us. That means we've been justified by his blood. Paul says, having been justified justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Justified, saved from God's wrath. And Jesus paid it all. He paid everything. And, And that's the perspective we need as we celebrate Jesus' eternal accomplishment. We can only be and will only be able to be rescued from God's wrath by Jesus' blood. So, are you amazed at Jesus? This this little celebration helps put all of our filth in perspective. Justified. Justified. Remember that word, justified as you think on the sacrifice of Jesus for you. At this time, I want uh, to ask one of our deacons, Mark Urosco, will you please pray before we eat the bread? Heavenly Father, God Almighty, you are the great I am, the creator of all things, perfect and holy, full of mercy, full of grace, and we are the created. We are full of sin, uh, without hope, enemies of God, Uh, but we know in your perfect plan you sent your one and only son to live a perfect life and die upon a cross for our sins, for the punishment that we deserve, and we know that for those who come to a saving faith in Christ Jesus by your grace, we can now stand justified and righteous before a just and holy God. Uh, We thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Let's remember Jesus body that was broken. Josh Threlfall, would you please pray before we drink the juice? Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to be a man. Thank you for humbling yourself uh, to death, uh, even death on a cross. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Uh, that was shed for us in a perfect sacrifice uh, so we could be perfectly justified. Thank you for uh, the blood represented uh, by this juice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's remember the blood of Jesus spilled for us. Amen. Let's all stand together and continue to worship through singing.
And Lord, we do confess that we need you. We need you not only for uh, tasks like enduring temptation and, uh, and fellowshipping and giving others the grace and love that you've extended to us. We also just need you for the basic things, for breath and life. Lord, we're always in need of you. Whether or not we acknowledge or recognize it, we always need you. So, Lord, would you help our hearts to keep that perspective as we go into this message, uh, to see what you have to say through your word, and I pray that as we receive the message, we would not lose that dependency upon you and that need for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Well, I'm glad to be with you all today, and if you're new to Countryside, we have two sermon series right now that are going parallel with each other. Uh, Pastor Mike, our lead teaching pastor, is going through the book of Colossians, and then the rest of us uh, associate pastors are preaching through the book of Matthew, and so that's where we are today. And also, I did just want to say, if you're brand new here, if, if you're still trying to figure out um, some things about Countryside, and you're here in the second service. Um, we have a new class that just started today, a newcomer's class, and it runs today. And then the next two Sundays, all together, those three classes will um, help you discover the history of Countryside, why we do what we do, our philosophy of ministry, our core um, beliefs and doctrines, um, and gives you a chance to ask some difficult questions and get clear answers for those uh, regarding where we're at. Um, if you want to and you're a brand new um, attender to Countryside, that class just started over here in room three, and so it doesn't hurt my feelings if you want to get up and go there. Um, just wanted to let you know that class starts uh, right now. Well, the passage we're going to observe today is one of those difficult passages, the kind that that paints a picture of Christianity we kind of shudder at. It's uncomfortable. I think we, we prefer a Christianity that lets us show up at church, get a nice Jesus-y message, lets us go home, and, and hopefully that that happiness kind of trickles down into our other spheres of life, and, and then maybe we can come back next Sunday and get some more. We love the idea of a Christianity that lets us go throughout our, our work week in our shells, no conflict, unnoticed, so that way we can, we can go back to our comfortably heated homes and watch sports and play games and eat delicious food and tuck our children peacefully into their beds. I think we really like the idea of a, a Christianity that, that allows us to carry on normal lives, doing the things we want, working for the employers we want, raising a family within the comfort that we want. But here's what makes us shudder. The thought that being a Christian means becoming a target. A target of hatred, discrimination, abuse, accusations. We shudder at the thought of our children becoming objects of scorn due to their identification with Christianity. So we don't like that stuff. I would argue that a lot of people have, at one time or another, had fears of losing money or downsizing or being hungry, maybe even death. But beyond that, beyond all of that, the thing that many in this room fear the most is the thought of becoming the most hated people in the world, in America, in the community at work, in your neighborhood, in your family. Because with, with all of that, with all of that, 
comes getting fired from your job and your kids being punished for their religious affiliation, your American dream shattering, just because you claim to be a Jesus follower. So when we get to Matthew chapter 10, it's like smelling a bowl of bitter soup that you wish you didn't have to eat. So we, we sort of push it aside. We think, maybe I can just skip dinner. Maybe I can just find something else in the pantry. Listen, friends, no matter how far you push the bowl away, you're still going to smell it. And that smell terrifies us because Jesus basically says that to follow him means becoming the most hated scum of the earth, suffering abuse, violence, and even death. That's a, that's a bitter bowl of soup, isn't it? Well, today we're not just going to eat the meal in front of us. We're actually going to see why this message is the opposite of what it smells like. We'll hopefully see how this message should impact us. <clears throat> Excuse me. How it should impact us with a different outcome than fear and trembling. And we're going to see how, if, if we take Jesus at his word, we're faced with a glorious task. One that's worthy of the name. One that brings greater and deeper, more satisfying joy than the kind of Christianity where we just sit in our bubble. All right, you can follow as I read our passage for today. We're going to be reading Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 25. It's a large section. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak, or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all. For my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Lord, would you help us now to understand your word, to be impacted by your word through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, kind of a heavy passage, huh? In order for us to take this message from Jesus and fully understand what it means and then what it implies for the Christian life, um, we need to get one thing straight. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his disciples. So Jesus is not addressing directly here millions of people who would read Matthew's gospel at a later time. However... However, we also need to remember that even though Jesus' words are not directly to us, they are for us. We must know the truths that Jesus is declaring because what is true for the disciples will also be true for us. Last time we were in this book, Pastor Phil preached verses 1 through 15, and we find Jesus doing something there that, that sets the stage for our text today. 
he sends out the disciples to do ministry. The beginning of this chapter, we see all 12 men that Jesus selected for the task, but Jesus told them specifically to not go somewhere. He restricted them to a certain group of people. It's the people of Israel, the lost ones particularly, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus mentions lost because the purpose of the mission is to spread one message that Pastor Phil mentioned last time. What's the message? The message is this, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' commission was unique here because not only does he give them instructions, he actually foretells things that are going to happen to them. And so I want to point out something that I think really helps us understand the text. See, Jesus' words throughout chapter 10, as we progress through the chapter, are kind of like looking through a spyglass. Some of you are familiar, have used a handheld spyglass telescope. I've, I've got a, a spyglass in my office at home. It's a, it's a replica, so it's not the real thing, but it's a replica of uh, ones commissioned by the, the British Navy in uh, the early 20th century. My kids like to come play with it, at least the, the smaller ones do. Tommy, you're a little too big for that now, but... If you've ever used one, you know that, that when you open it up to look through the spyglass, you open it all the, way, all the way out, and as you look through it, you collapse the telescope to actually see further. As the lenses get closer together, they magnify the image. And that's kind of like what Jesus is doing here, because Jesus begins with an immediate context— Speaking, speaking about how the disciples are supposed to conduct the mission in Israel. And then in our text today, Jesus presses in on the lens and he speaks about what's going to happen later. Speaking about things that would happen even after his ascension and way beyond into the future in the day of the Lord. So there's a, there's a lot to uncover today. I've broken down our text into five main sections. So if you like to take notes and you want to track how fast this thing is going so you know when you get to leave, um, we're doing this in five parts. In each part, our theme is the mission. The mission Jesus gave his disciples was a call to go into a lost and dying world, starting with Israel, calling people to repentance. But Jesus also fills them up with encouragement. He fills them up with encouragement. They're to remain steadfast. They're to understand the sober realities of the mission. And, and hopefully when we wrap up this message here at the end of the hour, my, my hope is that your heart will actually beam with confidence in the God of the mission, that you'll be driven to engage in the mission and that you'll have a right perspective of the danger of your association with the name Let's start by looking at verses 16 through 18, and here we see a warning for the mission. A warning for the mission. The task is dangerous. The task is dangerous. Look at verse 16 with me. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and and flog you in their synagogues, and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. So in the first section of Matthew chapter 10, from verses 5 through 15, Jesus gives a scene that we're just a little more comfortable with. The scene is the disciples going from house to house. Some people are going to reject the message. Some people are going to accept the message. Some are going to show hospitality. But we like that. We like that experience. At least it's, it's more comfortable for us. But here in our text, Jesus is looking further down the road for these disciples. And, and I believe the instruction he has for them has more to do with the future of the mission than the immediate context of their ministry. Why do I say that? Well, If you think about this, none of the disciples were flogged or um, 
flogged in the synagogues or dragged before governors or kings before Jesus' death, right? So we have to understand Jesus is now making points about what the future of their mission is going to look like. So we can see the warning that he gives. First, they're being sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What's the picture? What's the picture? The picture is that these guys don't stand a chance. That's the picture. They don't stand a chance. He's not sending them out as sheep to surround a wolf. He's sending them as sheep in the middle of wolves. Wolves are known to be able to do harm to an incredible number of sheep. I read a report that one pack of wolves had in some cases killed somewhere near 300 sheep in a single night. One pack of wolves. So the mission's extremely dangerous. Not not a safe mission. So who are the wolves that Jesus is talking about? Is it demons? Is it Satan? Actually, no. The, The primary instruments of God's enemy, whenever he tries to stop God's mission, it's always men. It's always men. Men who are trying to stop the mission. That's always been the enemy's strategy. And that's why Jesus says, beware of men. Men are the wolves. But notice the instruction Jesus gives here. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Well, what does Jesus mean? Well, serpents had by that time become a symbol of shrewdness. Shrewdness. Even the first record of serpents in Genesis chapter 3 reveals a cunning shrewdness, right? The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And so Jesus, by the way, he's not picturing picturing the poison of the serpent. He's picturing the shrewdness. Snakes know when to duck their heads. They know they're not liked. They know to move unseen in the grass. But Jesus gives another picture that's a great qualifier for that shrewdness. Be innocent as doves. So don't just play hide and seek in the mission. Don't just hide yourself. Be innocent as doves. What does that mean? Well, doves are about as innocent as they come, peacefully, sometimes annoyingly present. Doves are also pretty vulnerable. Why does Jesus use that picture? Well, here's why. Because the disciples need to take risks. Don't just hide. Don't just hide. You're going to have to be vulnerable. Taking the gospel into a hostile world is going to be risky. Be smart, but take risks. Jesus goes on to describe some very real events that would take place in the life of some of these disciples. So this is forward-looking beyond Jesus' time on earth. He says, beware of men. They'll deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. So here Jesus describes a very real physical danger that they'll be in. Beware of men, the wolves. The disciples can expect that the mission will bring them under punishment. That is two things. One, it's religious, and second, it's judicial. The synagogues were local places where religious leaders and scribes and rulers who uh, they could oversee the reading and exposition of the law. But they were also places where punishments were carried out for violating the law. Do we see that in the Bible? Yes, we actually see this in the life of the Apostle Paul before he got that name. Before his conversion, guess what? Guess what Paul did? He dragged followers of Jesus into the synagogues and had them punished, often by scourging. And it's amazing to think later on in his life, Paul experienced scourging no less than five times. Well, guess where that happened? Most likely, the synagogues, the very places where he once had Christians scourged. The disciples could expect this. It's a dangerous mission. 
But Jesus mentions something in verse 18 that's really extraordinary. The disciples would be dragged in front of governors and kings to bear witness to them and the Gentiles. So that's different from the mission we see in verses 5 through 15. We actually see a fulfillment of this in the book of Acts. Paul stood before God before Governor Felix, and finally appealed to Caesar. You can read about that in Acts 23 to 26. The mission would be one that would ultimately extend to Gentiles. All these things were spoken of by Jesus. You can imagine that his words were ringing in their hearts as they all eventually were persecuted deeply, most of them to the point of death, except for one of these twelve, Judas, who was not persecuted, but instead betrayed the Lord. But Jesus doesn't just give grim news and then leave them. Instead, uh, notice next, Jesus gives assurance for the mission. Assurance for the mission. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. Look at verse 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Something that I love in these verses is that Jesus does not speak about their fear of being persecuted yet. He does that later in verse 26. We're actually going to look at that next week. But here, Jesus is talking about another kind of fear, a different fear. The fear of not knowing how to speak or what to say under pressure. Don't be anxious. In what case? Well, in the instance of when you're delivered to governors and kings. When you're put on the spot before the elite, when being a follower of Jesus means proclaiming the gospel on the highest pedals, uh, pedestals of scrutiny. Here's some amazing assurance. God's going to be with you. He's going to speak through you. It won't be your words. That's amazing assurance. And you know what? We actually see an instance of this in the Bible. In the book of Acts, chapter 26, when Paul stood before the emperor What happened? What happened? Well, the account's amazing. Let's just read two verses from that. Listen to this. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. Except for these chains. What's remarkable is that in Acts 26, we have nothing less than the Holy Spirit himself making an appeal to governors and kings through the Apostle Paul, pleading with them to follow Jesus Christ. Friends, these words are comforting. Throughout history, there have been so many cases where people spoke in the most intense moments of persecution, facing death, facing Uh, torture, where the Holy Spirit gave calm, clear truth. I think these words of Jesus are really comforting for us. The question is, should we expect God to give us all kinds of stuff to say whenever we get in a difficult uh, circumstance? Well, I don't know that that's the right application for all situations, but I do know this, what this shows us. This shows us that when God calls His people to carry out the mission. The mission of sharing the gospel. We're not alone. God is not only with us, but we can be confident that God desires His words to go forth. And because God's character is to use His Holy Spirit to speak through His people, we should have faith that God will work through us to accomplish the mission. God will speak. That doesn't mean that God's going to supply everyone who is lazy and refuses to prepare. 
But instead, in the moment of persecution, you don't need to be afraid of, what's, of what you're going to say because God will give you the words. I think if that's true for the disciples, if that's true for the followers of Jesus carrying on the mission, we can understand that God's like that still. He's still like that. We can be confident that the Holy Spirit will sustain us and supply us in the most intense moments of persecution. So Jesus not only speaks of amazing assurance for the mission, he moves on to endurance for the mission. Endurance for the mission. Persecution will intensify, but the end is worth it. Persecution will intensify, but the end is worth it. You see this uh, beginning in verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. These verses are really kind of scary, aren't they? When we read them, our minds drift into thoughts of situations that that people have faced in some of our lifetimes. Places like Russia, China, Afghanistan, Syria. Families turning against each other, turning in Christian family members, even their own parents or children to the authorities. If that sounds far-fetched to some of you younger people, it's been happening in your lifetime while you've been playing volleyball and soccer and finishing your homework. Families in other parts of the world are being torn apart by Christianity, and they're being put to death. Some of them are getting turned in by their own family. That's happening right now. You know what? Someday in our country, when it becomes criminal to speak certain beliefs, I think the first people to be turned in will will probably be your pastors. And I, I think those reports if I'm being really honest, are probably going to go out to the authorities from people within our church. That's just the reality. Why? Well, because Jesus said that the reality will be that not only government authorities, but people who are so much closer will bring persecution. Family members. So it's not too far-fetched to imagine that, that some bosses or co-workers or fellow coaches and neighbors and people who are friends, but deeper than that, children, spouses, parents will be responsible for persecution. What's so heavy is that Jesus repeatedly says, death, death. So this is not just reporting people for a misdemeanor. It's literally reporting people so that they will be put to death. By the way, if you think our enemy is not set on that goal, if you think he's not been planning that tactic, then you need to wake up. Jesus spoke of this elsewhere in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 24. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another, and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And friends, here we find Jesus repeating something from our text, the word endure. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, how is that motivating? It's motivating because it reminds us that it's all worth it. You might be wondering, is is Jesus saying that the way to salvation is to endure? Is he talking about salvation through works? No, Jesus isn't saying anything like that. Instead, Jesus is supporting what he's already been saying in Matthew's gospel. When he said things like, you'll know them by their fruits. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven." Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus has been saying all along, He's been saying all along that those who truly belong to Jesus will be known by their fruits, they'll be persecuted for their faith. Those who are not simply Christians by association, but who actually demonstrate and their lives prove an inner reality that they truly belong to God. So Jesus is not saying that that the only way to salvation is by enduring persecution. In fact, throughout church history, people have been gravely mistaken to think that persecution earns them a spiritual standing before God. Jesus here is pointing out that those who belong to God will endure to the end of their persecution, which in the immediate context of Matthew 10 means death. So to answer the question, enduring persecution doesn't make you saved. Friends, you're not saved because you endure. Instead, you will endure because you're saved. The enduring will prove the salvation. That salvation will be so worth all the persecution, all the hardships, all the pain. But back in our text, Jesus' next words are very important. Instead of the disciples getting the idea that they can run blindly into persecution, Jesus talks about something else, direction for the mission. Direction for the mission. When persecuted, continue the mission elsewhere. When persecuted, continue the mission elsewhere. Verse 23, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you'll not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now this this verse is really sort of curious in the context. What's Jesus talking about? Well, first... First, we need to understand that Jesus' main theme here is the mission. The mission must continue. So for the disciples to flee, using Jesus' words, for them to flee, it's not a sign of cowardice. Instead, it's a sign of loyalty to the mission. The mission must continue. It must go on. Think of it this way. If the disciples get the notion that They're supposed to stand up and fight against every single persecution. The mission's really not going to go anywhere. The mission's not going to move much at all. So the fleeing, it's not a cowardly fleeing. It's the same wisdom that Jesus himself employed on multiple occasions. When, When he fled or escaped... Not out of fear, not being scared, just dedicated to the mission. This this brings up another great point, friends. Jesus is not calling the disciples to change their theology, but instead just to change their geography. Keep the same mission. Move it on. Don't stay and fight and stall the mission. In early church history, we can actually see how this played out. Persecution in the first few centuries led to people moving into new towns and cities and regions where the gospel was preached for the first time. And when we we stand back and we, we zoom out and we look at the early church persecutions, we see something amazing. The enemy used persecution to try and stop the mission, but God allowed persecution to actually further the mission. God's amazing like that. 
He's amazing like that. Even the enemy's attempts to stop the gospel spreading only helped secure the further spread of the gospel. So Jesus' words here are wisdom for the movement of the mission to new places. There's a statement Jesus gives here that we can't skip over, even if it's a hard one to understand. You're probably wondering about it at the end of verse 23. Jesus says, For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Well, what's Jesus talking about? Was Jesus mistaken? Was he mistaken? No, Jesus was not mistaken. I believe he was forward-looking to the time when he will come as the Son of Man to rule in judgment, his second coming. In the immediate context, by the way, we have to read this in the immediate context, Jesus is referring to the urgency of the mission. It's urgent. So when you get persecution, move on. Keep it going. And we already know that in this portion of the text, what's in perspective is a worldwide mission. Keep it going. Don't, don't stop and fight persecution. Keep it moving. The mission is urgent. And so in a forward-looking sense... Even when the universal mission becomes the focus of the church age, the mission to Israel still has a priority. We know from the prophets and from the book of Romans that there will be no universal acceptance of Jesus among Jews until the end arrives. So there's a priority for the mission. So even when the mission's worldwide, still continue the, the mission among the nation. In fact, we're going to see a, a little bit more of this and understand this better when we get to Matthew 24 and 26. Jesus addresses some things that are going to happen at the end of the age. And I believe that that relates to this, that son of man reference that, that Jesus is using is a reference uh, to that uh, day of the Lord. We'll talk more about that at the end of Matthew. But we do understand that the mission among God's people, if you don't get anything, just get this, the mission among God's people isn't going to stop until Jesus returns. That's the point. It's not going to stop. It's going to keep going. And lastly, Jesus points the disciples to the reality of the mission. The reality of the mission. What's the reality of the mission? Is this, expect at minimum the same treatment Jesus received. Expect, at minimum, the same treatment Jesus received. He illustrates this in verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? The final point Jesus makes here in our text is a reality check. And so he uses an example, a disciple and a servant. Both are not above their teachers or masters. Jesus is stating that they should expect to face what Jesus himself will face. Persecution, hatred, death, they should expect that. To follow in Jesus' footsteps is to go upstream against a raging river of sinful, hell-bound souls. Jesus is offensive. He's offensive. So the disciples should expect that they'll be reviled if Jesus is reviled. They should expect that they'll be persecuted if Jesus is persecuted. And if he suffers loss, then they will suffer loss. If he is put to death, they will be put to death. So they'll be like him in his suffering. But also Jesus states that they'll be like him in his mission and in his character. He says it's enough, it's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. You know, it's amazing when you look at the whole of chapter 10, you look at everything starting at verse 5 up to this point, when Jesus is giving them different instructions, what's amazing is that Jesus walked all of those paths before them. All the way up to being before rulers and kings. 
Jesus walked ahead of them, and he called them to do what he did first. As they follow Jesus' mission, they should expect to experience what Jesus himself will experience. The last part of verse 25 is an illustration, a great illustration. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Beelzebul, without going into all of the details, is a reference that brings to mind the blasphemy. Uh, against Jesus. We saw that in chapter 9. We're going to see it again in chapter 12. Uh, The religious leaders, they had no response to Jesus' power other than to attribute his power to satanic power. Um, Total blasphemy. And Jesus' reference here in our text reminds the disciples that people are going to see the power of the mission They'll hear the truth of the mission. They're still going to hate. They're still going to persecute. They're still going to kill. That's the reality of the mission. So, that's a tough passage, huh? That's heavy. Let's close with a few thoughts. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, I want us to just take a step back. I want us to just take a step back. And I think there's, there's three things that I'd like for us to take away from, from this. There's three, three uh, two realities and one call. Here's the first one. Persecution is terrifying for those who are not fulfilling the mission. Persecution is terrifying for those who are not fulfilling the mission. Listen, friends, can I lovingly say, if your version of Christianity is a life that's as easy and as comfortable as possible, then persecution is absolutely going to wreck your world. If what you value most in this life is your money and your experiences and your stuff, then guess what? Persecution threatens all of it. You know, sadly, there are many Christians today who are more fired up to defend a pantry full of MREs than they're fired up to rescue souls. If you're not fulfilling the mission, then persecution threatens you with the loss of everything. Number two, persecution is glorious for those who stay on mission. Persecution is glorious for those who stay on mission. Say, friends, if your life is all about the mission of Jesus, if your values are not locked into your stuff, then persecution really is not a deep threat. You know what it is? It's validation. You're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. You're following his call to be a foreigner and a stranger in this world with the message of salvation. You see, in the days ahead, there will be fewer and fewer and fewer people who remain true to the mission. Why? Because they're too afraid to lose what they have in this life. But for people who value Jesus' mission above all else, then success means persecution. Jesus said back in chapter 5 that we should rejoice. We should rejoice if we experience persecution for his name's sake. Why? Because great is your reward, Jesus said. Listen, friends, if you get to go through persecution, and I say get to, if you get to go through persecution, you are going to experience a side of God that few of us know. A closeness. A great help. 
Jesus promised that the Spirit of God would be with us if we experience persecution. He will be faithful. So number three, persecution will come. So be faithful to the mission. Persecution will come. So be faithful to the mission. Listen, friends, if your heart wants, if you're listening to this today and your heart wants to be on mission, if you want to spread the good news of redemption through Jesus Christ, then listen to Jesus' words. What's true for the disciples will also be true for us. Be wise. Don't fight everyone. Don't halt the mission. Move it if you have to. Continue the mission. If it means persecution, you can be confident that God will give you the words to say in each of those moments. He'll be with you. He'll work through you. You must simply endure. You know what? It's going to be more than worth it. In fact, Paul says you can't even put the two side by side. The persecution in this life and the reward that's to come. So Jesus gave an important mission to the disciples. You might be wondering, Michael, wasn't that just for the disciples? Wasn't that just for them? Can we just set that aside as a sort of direct commission to them? No. No, we can't. Because the same mission would be the message of Jesus' great commission that extends to us as well at the end of Matthew's gospel. And you know, Paul and Peter both tell us that persecution is going to be attached to the name. What name? Jesus. The name of Jesus. I want to close just with one question. I'm going to ask you a question, and maybe you can think about it this week. I encourage you to pray about it. Maybe you talk about it on the way home. Here's the question. What needs to change in your life to get you back on the mission? What needs to change in your life to get you back on the mission? Let's pray. God, thank you for our time we've had here today. We need your strength. We need your help. We're admittedly intimidated by the thought of experiencing what we've not experienced. But Lord, we can be confident that you will be with us, that if we do experience persecution, that it will be even cause for rejoicing for the reward. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be wise, to be people who value your mission more than our stuff. I pray that we would be more eager to fulfill your mission than we are to keep and hoard what we can in this life. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. stand to worship.
What a great comfort that he will hold us fast. He won't let our souls be lost. His promises will last. What a great comfort. I want to close our, our service with the Apostle Paul's attitude about enduring uh, difficulties even to the point of death. He says this in his letter to the Philippians. Uh, chapter 1. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at, be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul subscribed to the mission. Let's do the same. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.